Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Horrocks. I'm a board member of the Ephemera Society. And it is my great pleasure to, I have to take my glasses off. Jennifer Sopko is a writer and a historian with a love of local history, a Pittsburgh native who grew up in the White Oak Borough. Jennifer's writing projects focus on Western Pennsylvania with goals of enlightening readers about forgotten and obscure regional history and in reinterpreting familiar stories. Jennifer holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania. Since 2003, Jennifer has covered the Ligonier, did I say that right, Ligonier? Ligonier Valley in Westmoreland County in Western Pennsylvania as a freelance writer and journalist for several regional publications, including the Latrobe Bulletin, the Ligonier Echo, the Westmoreland History Magazine, and Westmoreland History Magazine. She is the author of Ligonier Valley Vignettes, Tales from the Laurel Highlands, published in 2013, and Idlewild, History and Memories of Pennsylvania's Oldest Amusement Park, published in 2018. Her next book will cover the lost amusement parks across Western Pennsylvania. Jennifer is an editor of Westmoreland History Magazine, a triennial publication of the Westmoreland Historical Society, and an active community volunteer. She is also a board, a board director or member of the Ligonier Valley Railroad Association, the National Amusement Park Association, Historical Association, the American Coastal Enthusiasts, <laughs> Western Pennsylvania chapter and the National Carousel Association, the Senator John Hines Center, the McKeesport Regional History and Heritage Center, and the Tube City Community Media Incorporated. Her topic uh, today is creating amusement parks in Western Pennsylvania. Jennifer. Thank you, Tom. And besides all that, I have a day job because that actually pays the bills. <laughs> but thank you for the introduction, and it's great to be here as part of Ephemera 42. Uh, this is actually the first conference I've ever been to, um, so it's been really great meeting new people, learning more about what Ephemera is, and learning more about the Ephemera Society. And I'm really pleased to be here uh, sharing my knowledge and research on one of my favorite historical topics, amusement parks. So from Europe to the United States, amusement parks have historically served as community gathering places where folks of different heritage and social class enjoyed recreation, thrills, and entertainment in outdoor spaces. The confluence of several factors spurred the growth of picnic rows and amusement parks in post-Civil War America developing industries, expanding transportation systems, evolving technology, and increased leisure time for the middle and working classes. Western Pennsylvania was a prime example of this phenomenon as dozens of parks sprung up along electric streetcar lines, on the outskirts of towns, and in scenic rural areas during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. They served as respites from the daily grind and even grime of cities like Pittsburgh, Johnstown, and Erie. Using ephemera, I'd like to show how these parks were designed to attract a population boosted by Western Pennsylvania industry. Many strategically plotted along transportation networks and among the diverse landscapes found in this region. Appalachian mountain ranges, forested valleys, river networks, and even rugged lake coastline. So again, three factors influenced and challenged amusement park entrepreneurs when creating their recreational spaces in western Pennsylvania. Transportation, industry, and topography. Many parks in the late 19th and early 20th centuries were started by local transportation companies to generate passenger business along their lines during evenings and weekends, outside of daily work commutes. 
Not only does J.M. Kelly's 1895 map of Pittsburgh show the confluence of the Allegheny, Monongahela, and Ohio rivers, but the dotted red lines and narrow yellow lines also show the networks of steam railroads and electric street railways that also intersected in the Pittsburgh region during this time, as they did in other parts of Western Pennsylvania. Railroads brought folks to some of the earliest established parks. Pennsylvania's oldest operating amusement park, Idlewell Park in Ligonier Township, was established in 1878 by the Ligonier Valley Railroad, and it was added as a seasonal stop on the line schedule. Aliquippa Grove in Beaver County opened in 1880 along the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie Railroad at the future home of the Jones and Lachlan Steel Mill. Rock Point Park outside of Elwood City in Lawrence County was another park developed by a local railroad that would eventually become part of the Pittsburgh, Youngstown, and Ashtabula Railroad and later absorbed into the Pennsylvania Railroads Network. But as you can see by the long list of parks on this slide, it was primarily the growing electric streetcar lines in and between cities that would spur the development of what were called trolley parks around the turn of the century. By then, local streetcar lines and interurbans that connected multiple cities and towns had begun to expand across the country, making travel faster and easier than it had been with the earlier horse-drawn on the buses, cable railways, and steam-powered trains. And it's a little obscured there by the um, Pittsburgh Railways token, but I think you get the idea of just how many parks there were in the different, the greater Pittsburgh region, Laurel Highlands and the southern Alleghenies, and in the northwestern region of uh, this part of the state. Portions of this 1918 electric railway map of Pennsylvania, seen here, show all of the networks around Erie, Beaver, and the greater Pittsburgh region. Pennsylvania, in particular, boasted more trolley companies than any other state in the country, according to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, even more than the state of New York, which had the highest number of miles. For example, in 1917, one of the peak years during the trolley era, Pennsylvania had 120 operating street railway companies, while New York only had 101, according to a 1917 U.S. Department of Commerce Census Bureau report on electric railways. Many parks would naturally be established along existing streetcar lines, or routes would be extended to service independently established parks such as Eldora Park near Denora in Washington County, or Westview Park near Pittsburgh, for example. These parks benefited from streetcar service, but were not actually founded by the companies, although they could be considered trolley parks as well. Many of these parks evolved from simple picnic groves with maybe one or two rides, a boating lake, um, into full-fledged amusement parks with multiple rides and attractions. Uh, conveniently powered by the electric lines that propelled the streetcars. Locally based companies included the New Castle Traction Company, which owned and operated Cascade Park from 1897 until the city of Newcastle acquired it in 1934. This survey based map shows the park's layout as of early 1899, and you can see the trolley loop and station near the proposed lake. Another example is the Beaver Valley Traction Company, which in 1901 purchased and developed two parks on both ends of its streetcar line in Beaver County. Junction Park was located in a more industrialized and flood-prone area known as Junction Stretch along the Beaver River in Rochester Township. The park's entrance and its attractions, which included a roller coaster and carousel, were right off the trolley line, as you can see in this postcard. The more rustic Murado Park, also called Murado Springs Park, was located in Beaver Falls at the northern end of the trolley line near the Wallace Run Ravine. 
Streetcar passengers also disembarked at a covered station right off the line and entered the park to enjoy picnics, rides on its carousel, and, starting in 1926, a swimming pool. Both Junction and Murado would close after the Beaver Valley Traction Company discontinued service in 1937. Consolidations of the smaller local companies into interurban systems, along with their parks, gave us conglomerates including the well-known Pittsburgh Railway Company and West Penn Railways. Pittsburgh Railways would operate four key Pittsburgh area trolley parks at the turn of the century. Kennywood Park in West Mifflin, Calhoun Park in Lincoln Place, Oakwood Park in Crafton, and Southern Avenue Park in Carrick as highlighted in the PRC's Pittsburgh's Popular Parks pamphlet. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> West Penn Railways would also come to acquire its own amusement parks, including Olympia Park near McKeesport in Allegheny County, Oakford Park between Jeanette and Greensburg in Westmoreland County, Lenape Park in Catanning in Armstrong County, and Grifflo Park near Apollo, also in Armstrong County. These parks were also originally established by smaller lines that would be absorbed by West Penn. I have to point out on the Oakford Park piece of ephemera, it says, come along with us, you will enjoy life. Bring your children, also your wife. <laughs> okay, moving on to industry. Amusement park development in western Pennsylvania was also strategic because of the audience these places attracted. Amusement parks provided patrons with an escape from and contrast to the industry that was cropping up all over western Pennsylvania, from natural resources extraction to manufacturing. The high quality bituminous Pittsburgh coal seam, processed in numerous coke ovens around the area, fed the steel mills in Pittsburgh and Johnstown. Western PA was also known for glass production. Thanks to cities like the trio of Jeanette, Mount Pleasant, and Arnold in Westmoreland County. And Northwestern Pennsylvania is considered the birthplace of commercial oil production. The Drake Well in Titusville would launch that global industry beginning in 1859. In the late 19th century, uh, the region saw a wave of Southern and Eastern European uh, immigrants who settled in and around industrial towns. Uh, employees would be needed at plants like the Cambria Ironworks in Johnstown, the Jones and Laughlin Steel Company in Pittsburgh and Aliquippa, the American Steel and Wire Company in Denora, and the Homestead Steelworks. So Western PA's diverse industries in turn spurred business for local amusement parks became, because they became the sites for group picnics held for these companies' employees and their families, from Heinz, seen here, and Westinghouse, to U.S. Steel and Alcoa, among many more companies. Uh, but park patrons weren't limited to companies, though, uh, company employees. Uh, they also attracted churches of many denominations, schools, unions, social clubs, political rallies, and ethnic communities. Even the Ku Klux Klan hosted picnics at some of these parks in the 1920s. Okay, now moving on to this slide. Uh, these groups often produced programs and other memorabilia to commemorate their amusement park outings and identify their members. The keystone shaped program seen here was for an employee picnic for the Pennsylvania Lines, a holding company of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which operated Elwood City's Rock Point Park. Uh, buttons, pins, and ribbons were also popular souvenirs, and I've included a few here. Uh, we have the sixth annual Westinghouse High Voltage Insulator Company picnic in 1924 at Idlewild Park in Ligonier. The 1909 annual picnic for the Oil Well Supply Company at Conneaut Lake Park in Crawford County. The 1914 Brotherhood of Locomotive Firemen and Engine Men meeting and picnic at Lakemont Park near Altoona. Those are a mouthful. 
Uh, we even see watch fobs like these for the Western Pennsylvania Firemen's Association at Junction Park in 1923 and the American Sheet and Tin Plate Company at Cascade Park in 1911. And all of these different groups I've mentioned enjoyed amusement parks that were also purposefully planned around the unique topography of Western Pennsylvania, which comprises about a third of the state, all of the counties west of the Appalachian Divide. The region sits within the Appalachian mountain range, so you find hills and mountains, valleys and gorges. We also have an extensive network of waterways that feed into the Ohio River Valley in the southwestern part of the state, where the Monongahela and Allegheny Rivers converge with the Ohio River at the city of Pittsburgh, considered the gateway to the west. Lakes include Conneaut Lake in northwestern Pennsylvania, a subregion that also borders Lake Erie. Uh, you'll also find parks along and near the Yokogany River, Brush Creek, the Kiskaminitis River, Connemaw River, Loyal Hannah Creek, Beaver River, Conequinessing Creek, French Creek, Oil Creek, and Four Mile Creek, among many other smaller streams. Thus, throughout western Pennsylvania, a number of parks were built alongside rivers or lakes and within forested valleys and glens. Souvenir postcards featuring amusement park scenes like these seen here illustrate the natural features and topography across western Pennsylvania from the greater Pittsburgh area east toward Johnstown and Altoona, north toward Erie, and south toward West Virginia. Much of the surrounding scenery included rolling hills and mountain ranges, as you can see here at Luna Park in Johnstown and Dream City in Wilkinsburg. Buildings, rides, and other attractions were also plotted among the existing natural features of the park sites. Dance halls and dining pavilions could be placed on tiered hillsides, overlooking attractions below, such as at Alameda Park in Butler or Cascade Park in Newcastle. These were large buildings, often two stories, designed to hold large numbers of people. Some parks were built at sea level, like Perkins Park along French Creek in Cambridge Springs and Idlewild along the Loyal Hannah Creek in Ligonier. You could ride the, shoot, the shoots ride at Cool Coney on the Ohio, seen here in the upper right. Pittsburgh's short-lived Coney Island was created on Neville Island, surrounded by the Ohio River and accessed by boat, train, and trolley. Other parks were set on plateaus or bluffs overlooking the water below, like Rock Point Park, bottom left, above, above the confluence of the Beaver and Conequinessing Rivers. Or you also have Kennywood Park above the Monongahela River, as seen in the 1900 G.H. Hopkins and Company map of Mifflin Township at the bottom right. Lakeside resorts included Waldemere Park as well as Four Mile Creek Park. Both parks were situated along Lake Erie on the opposite sides of the city of Erie and accessed by the Erie Electric Motor Company streetcar line. Four Mile Creek Park's origins begin in 1887 when Jacob Lang and Christian Rabe purchased 13 acres of Richard Crawley's land along Lake Erie at the mouth of Four Mile Creek. A large hotel called the Grove House was built on the bluffs overlooking the lake and soon folks would arrive by steamer and follow the steps up the hill to the Grand Hotel. This 1917 A.H. Mueller map of Mill Creek Township, postcard and photograph, showed just how close Four Mile Creek Park's attractions were to both the lake and the stream. Those included a roller skating rink, dance hall, outdoor summer theater, figure eight roller coaster, and Philadelphia Toboggan Company Carousel Number 18. Now known as Conneaut Lake Park, Exposition Park on Conneaut Lake in Crawford County appears in these two circa 1909 panoramic views. 
The boat dock obviously indicates that steamers and ferries provided transportation to these lake-based parks, along with the railroads and streetcars. Now, if there wasn't an existing boating lake, one could be artificially made, like at Luna Park in Johnstown, seen here on this beautiful letterhead. And that, uh, that lake was surrounded by a harness racing track. Other man-made lakes could be found at Shady Grove Park in Lamont Furnace, outside of Uniontown, Lake Olympia at Olympia Park near McKeesport, Lake Placid at Oakford Park uh, between Greensburg and Jeanette, and the trio of Lake St. Clair, Lake Bouquet, and Lake Woodland at Idlewild. Idlewild Park is one of my favorite examples of how parks embrace the existing topography and how the owners and operators considered the park's natural beauty a major draw. Before it evolved into a full-fledged amusement park in the 1930s with numerous rides, game booths, more concessions, uh, Idlewild was a much simpler picnic grove um, with lakes and a steam-powered carousel uh, located along the Loyal Hanna Creek um, near Ligonier. Uh, it was built to boost passenger business on the short line Ligonier Valley Railroad. In 1878, William M. Darlington granted Judge Thomas Mellon and his railroad the right to use part of a fan-shaped tract of land for picnic purposes or pleasure grounds with the condition that no timber or trees were to be cut. This 1891 Latrobe View Company photograph of the picnic grounds indicates that the railroad followed this directive, building a pavilion around an existing tree. And this trend um, continued throughout the mid 20th century at Idlewild as rides, buildings, and picnic benches frame the elder trees still standing at the park. For years, when amusement entrepreneurs tried to place additional attractions at Idlewild, they were rebuffed. Ligonier Valley Railroad Superintendent George Seneth, in this April 5, 1895 letter, declined T.M. Harton's apparent request to place a roller coaster at Idlewild, writing, I can't see that I can give you any encouragement for your roller coaster, the merry-go-round privilege being let. The company is averse to placing any more attractions than we now have, at least not this year. But as it grew over time, the railroad company and succeeding owners eventually allowed the addition of rides and other attractions at Idlewild, including a 1938 Philadelphia Toboggan Company Kitty Coaster. Uh, while it was built around an existing hill, Roller Coaster was actually constructed from felled oak trees on the property, which you can argue maybe went against that original precept. Uh, however, Idlewild's main amusement area remained shaded by trees and generally condensed within the original Darlington Tract years later, as seen on this late 1970s souvenir map. And it's still within that same general footprint today. Like with Idlewild's coaster, we also see the creative use of natural materials like trees and stone to build structures at these amusement parks that would blend in with the surrounding landscapes. When the Newcastle Traction Company took over the former Brinton Park picnic grounds in Newcastle in 1897, it engaged Boston landscape architect and civil engineer Frank Bladell, or Blaisdell, B-L-A-I-S-D-E-L-L, -L, uh, engaged him to revamp what became Cascade Park, as he had been responsible for designing other trolley parks in the United States. Among his improvements at Cascade, he incorporate, incorporated twig architecture into several pavilions and footbridges that spanned Big Run and the beautiful waterfalls that clearly inspired the park's new name. Those scenes were included in a promotional booklet of Cascade Park, uh, showing multiple examples of this popular architectural style during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, and that style was often used for bridges, pavilions, railings, benches, and boat docks, uh, trolley and amusement parks in Western PA, uh, including Mystic Park in Titusville, seen here. 
a twig architecture, which incorporated unpeeled and intertwined logs and branches, also appeared at other regional parks, including several I've already mentioned, uh, seen on this slide. Four Mile Creek Park, Aliquippa Park, Olympia Park, Morado Park, and Elk Park, which was another trolley park located in Girard, Erie County. To my knowledge, none of this beautiful architecture from any of these Western PA parks uh, has survived today. As much as the natural attractiveness of these spots uh, was romanticized, uh, we must remember that amusement parks were still commercial businesses. As such, rides, concessions, and game booths were also added, and a park's layout took into consideration where attractions could be placed to catch the immediate attention of folks stepping off the train or streetcar and entering the gates, ready to purchase a ride ticket, refreshments, or souvenirs. This undated broadside on the left shows the various attractions at Monarch Park, an amusement park between Oil City and Franklin, owned and operated by the Citizens Traction Company. Typical trolley park features here included several rides, large and impressive dancing and dining halls, flower gardens, bandstand, tree-covered picnic areas, natural streams and waterfalls, as well as Monarch Park's brilliantly illuminated 120-foot tall electric tower. The electrical layout on the right shows how close the merry-go-round, tower, and thriller roller coaster were within reach of patrons who disembarked from the trolley station, which is represented by a long rectangle at the head of the trolley loop. Photograph on the left shows the electric tower all lit up by the several thousand lamps that were powered by the electricity conveniently supplied by the streetcar line. The height and unique style of this structure would naturally grab your attention. Uh, the electric tower also appears in the postcard on the right, which features some of Monarch Park's numerous examples of that graceful twig architecture. Uh, while no means the only attractions installed at amusement parks, uh, carousels and roller coasters are perhaps two of the most iconic. <coughs> coasters placed at Western Pennsylvania parks were developed by well-known manufacturers and designers, including John A. Miller, who designed Monarch Park's Thriller Coaster, and the Ingersoll Construction Company, who built it, according to these 1913 blueprints. Miller's creations would also appear at parks I've previously mentioned, including Kennywood Park, Waldemere Park, and Perkins Park, as well as Ivyside Park in Altoona and Maple View Park in Cannonsburg. Mm -hmm. The Ingersoll Company was Pittsburgh-based, along with the TM Harton Company, another well-known business, but we also see the E. Joy Morris Company, uh, G.A. Denzel, the North Tonawana-based companies, and my personal favorite, Philadelphia Toboggan Company, all placing their carousels and or roller coasters at Western Pennsylvania parks. Okay, for example, uh, before Philadelphia Toboggan Company's number 83 carousel came to Idlewild in 1931, it had what was likely an Armitage Herschel steam riding gallery seen here in 1891 and advertised in the Street Railway Journal a publication for the electric streetcar industry. In 1896, the park switched to a TM Hartenberry go round and would continue with that company for 35 years. This is one of, another one of my favorite pictures of Idlewild. I just wish everybody wasn't standing in front of the carousel. <laughs> At the turn of the century, a uh, figure eight toboggan slide, a stacked side friction roller coaster, was a common addition at amusement parks. Designers like Miller eventually realized they could utilize these parks' natural landscapes to their advantage, conceiving roller coasters that plunged over hillsides and into ravines, no doubt increasing the thrill factor. Sanborn fire insurance maps provide great insight uh, into how these rides, buildings, and other attractions were arranged on amusement park properties and how those layouts evolved over time. Uh, this Sanborn fire insurance map of Homestead, updated in 1955, is a great example of this, as it shows three roller coasters constructed over ravines at Kennywood Park, 
once dubbed the coaster capital of the world. Uh, designed by either John Miller or Miller and Harry Baker, we see the 1920 double dip jackrabbit adjacent to the 1927 Mobius tracked racer on the right and the 1924 Pippin on the left, which would later be redesigned as today's Thunderbolt, my favorite coaster at my hometown amusement park. Uh, another quick example, um, on the left, this Sanborn Fire Insurance map of Newcastle shows Cascade Park in 1904. You see the massive dancing pavilion on a sloped hillside leading down to a cliff overlooking Big Run and Big Run Falls. It also shows the park's first coaster, a figure eight, also designed by Miller and built by Ingersoll. In the 1920s, popcorn and peanut concessionaire Billy Glenn's new roller coaster called the Gorge took advantage of the natural ravine created by Big Run. 1941 overlay is blocking some of the track layout on the second map on the right, but underneath, you can still see part of the Miller and Baker creation that was built over the stream. And in 1955, a new attraction later renamed the Comet would be the second generation of roller coasters built within Cascade Park's Gorge. Most of these once operating amusement parks in western uh, Pennsylvania uh, that I've mentioned today were developed, uh, thrived, and then disappeared for a variety of or combination of reasons. Uh, the demise of streetcar service that brought customers coupled with the rise of the automobile, competition with other regional parks, financial woes in the Great Depression, fire and flood disasters, and decisions from owners not to continue in the industry. Today, only a handful have survived and are planning to open for the 2022 season. While they've evolved over the years, families and communities still gather together for group picnics under their trees. Uh, they scream as the roller coaster trains plunge over the hillsides and they enjoy the cheerful music from the carousel band organs. So I'd like to thank all of the historical societies, libraries, museums, organizations, and individuals who have shared images and information for my Western Pennsylvania amusement parks research, far beyond what I've shared today, uh, as well as Barbara Charles and the Ephemera Society of America for inviting me to be a part of this year's conference. Um, happy to take any questions you have today. Um, or if you think of something after the conference, if you have any research leads that could help me with my uh, lost Western PA Parks book, um, please feel free to contact me. And hopefully you were able to see everything okay. It looked a little better formatted on my laptop, but I think you got the gist of what I was trying to share with you all today. Thank you. Most coasters kind of ha give you this time going up that you can relax and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm big, I can, I can do this, this is cool. Not the Thunderbolt. Takes you out over a ravine and drops you immediately and it picks up its speed by going down into that ravine. It is a total shocker. I recommend it. And, and I think uh, the Comet in Newcastle was like that too. That was gone by the early 80s, so I unfortunately missed it. But that was apparently a pretty legendary coaster too. Sorry, I'm all the way in the back. I will be up front later this afternoon. <laughs> um, I was curious to know if the if at the same time the, the resorts in Pennsylvania that were so popular, did they did they kind of compete 
uh, um, or 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 did they work together? Did they did they um, you know uh, bring attendees to each right. to each kind of like the Mineral Springs kind yeah. of resorts? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of them. I know I, I, my husband's grandparents met at one, for example, and they talked about going to these parks. So their example led you know led me to ask this question. So. Right. Um, I just came across uh, a mention in a looking through newspapers.com about the Pulaski Mineral Springs. So that's something I want to kind of look into. Um, Oakwood Park, right outside of Meadville, um, right next to it, it was a trolley park, um, right next to it was um, another Mineral Springs, and I'm blanking on the name even though I just looked at it and just did a social media post on it. Um, but they were, you know, if they were close together or had the same investors, um, they were certainly marketed together. Um, and, you know, especially if they were on the same trolley line, it would behoove the trolley company to, per, to promote both of them. You know, because it's, you know, even if the trolley company just operated like Oakwood Park, it's still going to make money with people buying tickets to ride the line to get to the Mineral Springs. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. Um, also in Titusville, there was Fieldmore Springs Park on the other end of the line from Mystic Park. And that one I'm kind of digging into because apparently there was a carousel there. Um, and I have a photograph, and Barbara's seen it, um, but I'm trying to get some corroborating evidence that it was actually at uh, Fillmore, at the Fillmore House, Fillmore Springs. But that, would, that could be an example of how the Mineral Springs type parks turned into more amusement resorts. with these amusement parks. And so if you go to Altoona, where the curve play now, from the bleachers, you can see the amusement park and the roller coaster at Altoona. Uh, the Lakemont Park? I don't uh, know what the name yeah. of it is, but it's right yeah. adjacent to the baseball field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, uh, Olympia Park near McKeesport, um, which is long gone by you know World War II, but my great aunt Sophie, who's still with us, she's 94, 95, remembers going to Olympia. Um, they did have a baseball field and the Homestead Grays played there, one of the, um, one of the uh, legendary Negro League teams. So that's something I'd like to kind of delve into a little bit more. You know, how, how maybe these uh, more professional teams um, played at the parks. And I think they also played at Idlewild too. Okay. Thank you so much.